started tonight, we're going away from our normal study. Last night, after uh, last Monday, after we got back from the retreat, we just kind of met together and uh, talked about some things. And really talked about uh, want the importance of you guys learning and knowing how to lead someone to the Lord. Now, I explained to you last week that as a youth pastor, my first priority with you as young people is to teach you the Word of God and provide sanctuary. And when I say that, that's to be protective, is to give you a youth group and a place where you can come and where it's, it's easier to be a Christian. You know, if you're going to have a good youth group, it ought to be easier to be a Christian. Sometimes you go other places and you hang around other groups of people, and it's not easy to be a Christian. All right? Sometimes you can go to youth groups, and it's not easy to be a Christian. All right? So um, I've learned over the years that if you hang out with the wrong crowd too much, as a young person, you're going to struggle. We used to do activities, evangelistic activities, and people would seem like the ones that brought the most visitors were the ones that had the majority of the most wrong friends, and they would always win the prize for bringing the most visitors, but after they graduated, none of them, I mean, I went back and looked, and hardly any of them were ever in church anymore. So I would much rather see you guys grow up as young people, establish a good foundation, and uh, serve the Lord all the days of your life based upon the foundation that you built. But at the same time, I do think it's important for you to learn the importance and the principles of being able to share the gospel with somebody else and to look for those opportunities to be able to do that. And on top of that, to make sure, because there can be a lot of confusion when it comes. We, um, this past Sunday morning, we, we went back over uh, and I went back through the Romans Road with everybody on Sunday morning, and we gave an invitation. And I did something that I haven't, I don't know if I've ever done it before. We, taught, we asked at the invitation the simple part, okay, who is confident that they're saved? Who is concerned that they're not saved? But then we asked one more question. We asked, got it? There you go. All right. We asked this, who is confused. And there were probably eight, nine, ten hands that went up and said, I'm a little confused about it. And that, that taught me some things. That helped me to realize some things. Because I remember growing up, I had a lot of questions. And I, I never would ask. Sometimes there didn't feel like there was the right person available to ask. And sometimes I didn't know what the question was to ask. So part of what I try to do is figure out what your questions are <laughs> and ask them for you. And that was interesting. And I, I remember I, I talked with uh, one of the young ladies in our youth group. We had a really good talk about things and just bringing about clarity. Because each one of you knows whether or not you're saved. I can't tell you. I can't look at you and say you're saved because you do good things. Right? You know, we talked about Hunter Willis got saved. Hunter Willis is a good kid. He came to me and said, you know, I would have never even thought he was coming to talk to me about that. But it helps us to understand that we can be religious and be lost. When somebody's rebellious, you know, their sin-cursed nature stands out more. But when somebody's religious, they do lots of good things, and they can feel good about it. But maybe in their heart and their soul, they realize that something's not right but their pride or their confusion will keep them from asking, all right? So it becomes very important for you guys to make sure when you're in your youth group, you, you really feel like, okay, it's better for me to ask a question. It's better for me to, if I'm not sure about something, to not have to worry about somebody thinking bad of me or looking down upon me, but that it's a place where I can be secure and that if I have a question, I can ask. So that's, that's really what we want for you. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go back through quickly the plan of salvation. And one thing, we're, we're going to do a little bit of studying tonight. Because there are places in your Bible where the plan of salvation can be confusing. 
because if you're not looking at the right message in the right gospel, it can become a confusing thing. So what we're going to do is I'm going to come over to the board real quickly, and I'm going to draw something out for you. It's our timeline. All right. So we will put, uh, let's put the cross about right here. We'll have Christ coming down as a baby. We will have Christ ascending after his resurrection. He goes, as preacher talked about last night, first he goes to the clouds, to the heavens. Remember in Acts chapter 7, Stephen looked up and saw him. But then it talks about that he goes far up above that afterwards, into the uh, far above all the heavens there. All right, so we have, we're going to draw our parentheses right here, which is usually, for some folks, the confusing part. This, can, this parentheses represents what we call the mystery. All right, the mystery was something that God revealed to the Apostle Paul and that was hid before the foundation of the world. What Christ preached when he was upon the earth here in his earthly ministry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first part of the book of Acts, he had a different message that he wanted to give when that message was rejected. So you have, we've gone back over here and we've drawn this out. We go back over to the Genesis and we have went like this and started right here. This is what we call the, the Jew or the nation of Israel, all right? With the Jew, you have the law. Down here, you have all the other nations. God elevated the Jew, made them his chosen people, utilized and changed the name of Abraham. And all the other, God's plan was for all the other nations to get to God through the Jew, all right? All during this time period, Genesis 1 through 11 there, it's about 2,000 years right there, we're not to scale, but everybody came the same way. Then God introduced a new program and utilized Abraham to be the father of that and gave him the law, called him the Jews, uh, separated them by circumcision and all these different things there. And this continued all the way up till the Messiah came. The Messiah came, and he was rejected. He was placed upon a cross. Even after he ascended, Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, all the way through chapter 7 there with the stoning of Stephen, they rejected him. And then something started to take place. There was a dissension, a transition. The Jew was no longer identified as God's chosen people. The, in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about the middle wall of partition was taken down. And you study in the book of Ephesians and other places how the law was done away with. And the mystery, or what we call the age of grace, was established. And there was teachings here that God gave to Paul that Paul had to give to everyone else that many of the Jews didn't like, many of the rebellious people didn't like. That's why he had to write all the letters back to those churches trying to correct them there. But there was things that God revealed during this time that had never been revealed over here. Okay? A few of the examples were, would be the body of Christ. When we get saved, the Bible says we're made members of his body. Okay? Back over here in his earthly ministry, his body was walking on the earth. And they literally followed his body. When he ascended, he says, when you get saved, you become a member of the body of Christ. Our hope is in what's called the rapture. The rapture is the event that takes place right here at the very end. So we put our line right on that parentheses and we take it up there. We make a cloud with my beautiful drawings. And so this is where we meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Next thing's going to happen, you got the seven years of tribulation. Then you got the thousand year kingdom. And see, what's important for you to understand is what started right here. And when the Jew and the Gentile 
became basically the same and got saved the same way. See, today people don't, we don't have to have a Jew. We don't have to go fall under the law and become Jewish in order to be saved. All during this time right here, they did because that was God's plan and program. Now, Israel failed in it miserably. They split. They were put into captivity. Um, all the different things that happen in the history and what we see in the Old Testament there. The Messiah comes. He's supposed to go into the temple. That's why Jesus would cleanse the temple. He was going to go in, give himself a sacrifice. So they didn't sacrifice him. They, they put him on a cross, which was the most despised way that a person could be killed under the law was the death of the cross there. Stripped completely naked, beaten, all we know the story, all that was there. Uh, but we also know that he went into the tomb three days later. He was resurrected. Then 50 days from that, on the day of Pentecost, all right, before that he ascends, and you have them, Peter, preaching on the day of Pentecost. All of Israel's there. So many of them, maybe over a million of them. And a lot of people say the day of Pentecost, it says 3,000 people got saved. Well, that was a great day. It wasn't a great day. If there was over a million people there, you do the math. Riley could do it quickly for us. You divide 3,000 into a million, you get a very small percentage. Okay? We'll let him. He's, I see his brain working back there. But it is a, it, it's a percentage that's not even worth mentioning. So what happened was, in Acts chapter 1, they were supposed to go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. They never made it out of Jerusalem there. So what happened there, in that little amount of time, and God already had this plan, he says, okay, I'm going to do away with this. And I'm going to introduce something new that's been hid since before the foundation of the world. And I'm going to allow people to get saved this way, to be placed in the body of Christ, to have the hope of the rapture, to be, and this was something that was new as well, to be eternally secure in their salvation. Once a person's saved, they're always saved. So is it one L or two? Anybody know? I think it's two? Okay. We'll vote on it. We'll say it's two. If I'm wrong, somebody will tell me later. All right, that's an ugly why, though. All right, so eternally secure. So you say, well, what's the difference between over here and over here? And I'm showing you all this. Yeah, Brother Mark, I thought he was going to talk about learning how to lead somebody to the Lord and learning what the gospel is. You are. But I have to show you this to show you that there is a gospel that's preached here and a gospel Let's see, let's preach there. Now let's look at the scriptures right quick. Let's go over to the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul is writing back to the Galatians there. And let's move on down just a little ways. Verse 7 says, But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John... Now, who's Cephas? Anybody know who Cephas is right there? It's almost a trick question. Evan, you want to say the answer, but you're, you're not real sure. Who do you think... <laughs> figure out who it is by looking at verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter. Peter was also named Cephas. All right? Peter and Cephas are the same person. When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, and they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen, and they to the circumcision. All right? So, logic looks at verse 7 and says... But contrarized, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, Paul, Barnabas, and the others, it says, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Well, the uncircumcised, uncircumcision would be the Gentiles or the other nations. Circumcision was part of being under the law and part of being a Jew. So there was a gospel that was going to the Jew and there was, a, to, the, um, to the circumcision, and a gospel that was going to go to the 
age of grace during this time. So there's two of them there. If you take the book of Acts, it's 28 chapters. The first 14 chapters deal mainly, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. The first 14 chapters deal mainly with the Apostle Peter. The second 14 chapters deal mainly with the Apostle Paul. All right? So you got two different things. You say, well, most people say this, that there's only one gospel. That there's only been one gospel all the way through here, that everybody back here was looking forward to the cross, and that that's how they got saved, by looking forward to the cross. Well, let me show you where the confusion comes in. This is how I was confused growing up. If we were to go over to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, I want you to look at the first four verses with me. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, let's identify the sign of thy coming. It's not when he comes in the rapture. Jesus comes right here, and we call this the rapture of the church. And it's also, and I'll, I'll abbreviate it, the judgment seat of Christ is going to take place right there. The judgment seat of Christ was never made known until it was made in the books of Romans through Philemon. It was part of the mystery there. So we'll put the judgment, ooh, that's terrible, seat of Christ. So all of these things are distinct to this time period. They'd never been revealed before. You see, the second coming that Jesus is talking about is when Jesus returns right here at the end of the tribulation period. When he comes back on the white horse, when he comes to proclaim judgment, when Satan is bound for a thousand years and he sets up his kingdom, that's a throne, upon the earth. So there is the second coming and there's the rapture, two different events. You say, how do you know he's not talking about the rapture right there? Because the rapture has not been revealed yet. The mystery, Romans through Philemon, were all books written by the Apostle Paul. They all represent the mystery that was given to him. So these books, nobody even knew about this outside of Christ himself during this time. Right here when Jesus is upon the earth, you got Matthew through what we'll call part of Acts there. Matthew through Acts. All right? So, he's talking about what's, what's going to happen. What's going to be the sign of thy coming? What are the events that are going to take place during this time? Well, he says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Who's that? That's the Antichrist. And shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. You can go to the book of Revelation and... When you got the, those first four horses, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse, the red horse represents war and what's going to take place during that time. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes. The famines and pestilences represent that black horse in the book of Revelation. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Why are they going to kill the believers during the tribulation period? What are they going to kill them for? Because they will not take the mark of the beast. And how are they going to kill them? They're going to chop their heads off, most likely with a sword there. And it says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Jesus himself says a person has to endure to the end of the tribulation period and not take the mark of the beast. 
in order to be saved. If you endure, you're working. The people going through the tribulation period, they're going to be supernaturally fed. If they're not, you know, taken out by the Antichrist and his government and his system there, they're going to evangelize, then they're going to evade, they're going to head to the mountains, and they'll be supernaturally cared for, but they're going to have to run, they're going to have to hide, and all of those are works. That verse says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. See, this is what you've got to remember in your Bible. There's more than one end. There's the end of the age of grace. That's when the rapture takes place. He comes back to get us. There's going to be the end of the tribulation period when he comes, Christ comes on that white horse and you have the battle of Armageddon. There's going to be an end of the kingdom when Satan is loosed for a season and there'll be what battle? If you were here last night, you might remember. You have the battle of Armageddon over here and the battle of... Good job. All right. Is that what you were going to say? Gog and Magog. All right. Yep, you got that one right there. You got the battle of Armageddon there. Two different battles. Over here, there's going to be a judgment. What's this judgment called? The great white throne judgment. Not the same as the judgment seat of Christ. See, we put all this stuff up here to be able to see the difference. But I also want you to see, as we saw, that there was more than one gospel. There's more than one way to be saved. Now, for us today, there's only one way to be saved. If we go to Ephesians chapter 2, some of you are familiar with this verse, 2, 8, and 9. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me ask you a question. If somebody says, okay, how do you get saved? Well, Ephesians says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. What well, they say, well, Jesus said in Matthew 24, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Which one's true? Correct. Both are true. One is true for this time period and this one. The other one is true for this. They cannot be true for both. You know what happens when you try to cram the two together? You know what I was taught growing up? Is you got saved based upon what Christ did on the cross, but then you had to be good enough, you had to endure to the end to keep your salvation. If you weren't good enough, you'd lose it. That's how you take both of them and put them together. Is that true? It's not. If it wasn't my works that saved me, if I couldn't be good enough to save myself, I can't be bad enough to lose it. You see, we get back over now, back to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 3, where this begins to be revealed. In verse 21, you see it highlighted there. Paul says, but now. Up to that point, Romans chapter 1, all the way through Romans 3.20, has been talking about the sinful condition of man. Whether he's a heathen, whether he's religious, whether he's Jewish, Doesn't matter. It it covers all of that in there. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law, without the law, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. What was the faith of Jesus Christ? It was his death, burial, and his resurrection. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If we were to go over there right quick and look at that verse, 1 Corinthians 15. Look at these first four verses. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, Paul says, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, this is where it can get confusing. You say, well... By which also you're saved. You you mean I have to keep something in memory in order to be saved? This is important. Whenever you see the word saved or salvation in your Bible, 
it doesn't always mean the same thing. It doesn't always have the same definition. You know, there's a, a verse in Philippians chapter 2 that says we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Does that mean we have to work to be saved? No. It means after we get saved, the word salvation means to be complete or to have victory in. Once a person is saved, after they get saved, they have a responsibility to work for the Lord. Now, they're not working to keep their salvation. They're working because they've been saved by grace through faith. The Jew has to do what? He has to work and endure to the end of this. See, what started right here got stopped for a while, and then it's going to pick right back up right over here and be completed. But see, when all this was written, Christ knew about Romans through Philemon, but the twelve did not. Peter, James, and John, when they wrote their books, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the book of Hebrews, when those books were written, Revelation, they didn't know about this right here. Saul wasn't even saved yet. He might have been saved at that point, but he hadn't got to that place where God had started revealing all this stuff to him here. So when you look at verses 3 and 4, he says, here's the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul says, I received this from the Lord, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, Peter, then of the twelve, and then above five hundred brethren at once. That's the gospel right here. The death, burial, and resurrection. What's our responsibility in it? We come back over to Romans chapter 3. We come on down. Verse 23, 24, it says, For all have sinned. No, go back to verse 22. I'm sorry. By the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Not that endure, that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace. We remember from yesterday, the word justified means declared righteous. Anybody else know what that sounds him? Y'all remember that right? Were y'all listening yesterday? Did you know what it was? What's justified mean? There you go. Good. You said it. See, it came out your mouth. That way I, I believe you now. All right? So we're seeing right here that Paul, based on what Christ gave him, is beginning to share this, that it's not of works, it's not enduring to the end. They have to endure unto the end and not take the mark of the beast in order to go into the kingdom and receive right here what's called the new covenant. All right? So look over here. If we go back to the book of Galatians, and I showed you the passage in chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 1. All right. Paul gives his usual you know, introduction there, an apostle. Watch what he says, though. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Not of men, neither by man. Remember that. And all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia. Grace be in you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now watch. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto what? What's it say? Another gospel. Obviously Paul had given them one and there were others after he left they said, now, and what's the word gospel mean? Good news or glad tidings, all right? That good news that he gave them, he says there's others that are coming and giving you another gospel. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, let him be, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now watch what he says. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. 
For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Hmm. He didn't have the gospel. He didn't learn his gospel from Peter and James and John. He says it was given to him by revelation. of It was given to him directly by Christ himself. Some people say, well, I don't understand that. Seems like the whole New Testament ought to just work together. Well, it does as long as you see the differences. If not, it's going to contradict itself. It's like, well, I don't understand how that God could just take all of his truth and give it to one man, Paul, and then him have to give it to everybody else. Because God doesn't work like that, does he? After Abraham, there was a man that God raised up to deliver Israel from the children, from over, for the children of Israel from Egypt. What was his name? Who let him? Who let him out? Moses. Moses spent some time on a certain mountain. Anybody know what mountain? Mount Sinai. Does anybody know what God gave Moses on Mount Sinai? He didn't just give him the Ten Commandments. He gave him the law. He gave him the Ten Commandments and the whole law. When Moses was up on Mount Sinai, Joshua was at the base. All the children of Israel were over there with Aaron, making their golden calf, being wicked, being a mess. Moses was by himself. So at that point, did anybody else have the law but Moses? No. God gave Moses the law all by himself, and he was responsible to go and give it to Israel, and Israel was to live by it and give it to all the nations. God did it again with the Apostle Paul. He gave him the mystery. You see, when you go over here to Romans chapter 16, and you look at verse 25, now to him that is of power to establish you, Paul says, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. What does that mean? If it was secret all the way back over here, did any of these people know about it? No. That's what it says. And a lot of people, when they study their Bible, they miss that. That's why you have some people that say you can lose your salvation. Some people say that, you know, you're eternally secure. Some people that kind of say both. And they try to mix all this together. But the fact is, we've seen there's more than one gospel. For them, for a different people in a different time period, for us today. You know, over here in the tribulation period, if a person is a believer and they take the mark of the beast, they're done. You know, there's that thing, you ever heard in your Bible, in Matthew chapter 12, where it talks about an unpardonable sin? Look at that with me. Matthew chapter 12. This can be confusing. I had somebody ask me this one time. If we're saved by grace through faith, and we're eternally secure, look at verse... Start in verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. For whosoever shall speak the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoso speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So if I were to ask you, if you're saved by grace through faith and not of works, and you're sealed unto the day of redemption, and you're eternally secure, can you commit the unpardonable sin? It's a little... He's like, no. 
Let's be honest. It's hard to give a confident answer, isn't it? Because you read that scripture right there, and you read the other, and it's like, well, which one's true? Well, Brother Mike could give us the answer again. Yes, both. If a person, and we're in the book of Matthew, this time period, before this has been revealed, like we saw, if a person, you say, well, what's he talking about this thing of you can say something against the Son of Man, which is Christ, but you can't say something against the Holy Ghost? Do you remember back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Man, we run out of time. There was a promise given. The promise of the comforter. Who was the comforter that was promised by Christ? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost there, right. And he was going to come and empower those folks, those witnesses that were going to go through the tribulation period. And in Acts chapter 2, remember they're in the upper room, they're praying, and all of a sudden what happened? It was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Those cloven tongues, like as a fire, came and settled on them there. Then they went out on the day of Pentecost. And all those Jews that had come from all those other nations because they had went away and rebelled and couldn't even speak the Jews' language came back. And them boys started preaching and everybody heard it in their own language. It was a miracle. It was miraculous. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, during the tribulation period, when they begin to deny the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, they're going to wind up blaspheming by taking the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast isn't going to be a microchip like people talk about. They're going to bow down to the Antichrist. They're going to take a mark, but they're going to blaspheme and go against that power and that work that God sent to save them and that witness that the Holy Spirit gives to them about who Christ is and his second coming. They're going to deny it. They're going to take the mark of the beast. That is the unpardonable sin. Say, Brother Mark, can we commit the unpardonable sin? You live here. We can't get right here. Why? Why? Because this ends when we all leave at the rapture. The people that have died, their bodies will be resurrected and glorified. We which are alive and remain, if Jesus comes back in our lifetime, if he comes back tonight, if he comes back during our Bible study, all of us that are saved, all of a sudden we're gone. Clothes on the ground. Immediately in heaven in a glorified body robed in his righteousness, ready to begin the judgment seat of Christ with him. As all, This is what goes on up in heaven. This is what's going to go on in earth. Where is Christ going to set up? Where is he promised? Christmas is coming. You're going to sing about Emmanuel. Emmanuel means what? God with us. God will be with them right over here When he comes back, Christ sets up his kingdom upon the earth and he will be with his people. And he will fulfill that promise there. I didn't really get to the practical side of what I wanted to. But I really feel like we got to deal with some of the confusing places to help you understand so that we can really hone in and show you the gospel. Because what what I was going to do tonight, we'll wind up doing it next week is we're going to go to John chapter 1 and John chapter 3. We're going to look at a conversation that went on between Jesus. Who did Jesus talk to in John chapter 3? Anybody know? What was his name? Jesus had a conversation with a Jewish ruler in John chapter 3. Say it if you know. Anybody know? Just say it. Try it. Nope. Try it, though. Good try. Jewish leader. Pilate wasn't Jewish. Starts with an N. Huh? Nicodemus. Okay. 
Bible trivia, everybody lost. All right, so he's going to have a conversation in in chapter 3 with Nicodemus, and he's going to talk about being born again. And what I want you, what I'm going to show you in the Bible is what the promise was of being born again was all the way back over here to this nation of Israel, because the Bible speaks about that nation being born in a day right here and receiving the new covenant. And it's important to see what's promised to them versus what's promised to us. So you get on down here somewhere where everything comes together and it's all one, but until then, God's got two different programs going on. He's got more than one gospel, and there's a lot of confusion that goes on. And we want to try to clear this confusion up so that you can be a good ambassador and a good witness of the gospel of the grace of God, not of the gospel that had to do with the Jew and the law and the kingdom and the new covenant of which you're going to have nothing to do with because you have your own promises right here that they don't get to have, that they don't get to have. It's for this. You say, well, what do the Jew do right now? They do the same thing we do. How does the Jew get saved today? He gets saved by grace through faith. He takes a Bible and believes on the death, burial, and resurrection. And the finished work of Christ has nothing to do with his nationality or his genealogy. What stopped here starts again back over there. All right? All right, right, way out of time. Let's pray. Now, Father, Lord, we got a lot that we're trying to cover. And, Lord, it'll take us a little time. So, Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, keep these, these teachings in the hearts in the minds of our young people, Lord, I know not all of it makes sense to them, but Lord, it'll take us some time, Lord, to put it all together. Lord, I believe once it all comes together, it's just like when that jigsaw puzzle comes together and all the pieces are put there and then there's a clear picture. Father, I pray, Lord, that this would be clear to our young people. And Lord, I pray that each one of them, Lord, they, I, I know there were things they saw tonight that they don't understand or that they have a question about. Lord, help them to be able to put their questions together. And Lord, give them enough courage and concern to to ask those questions. And Lord, to further their own knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Father,